Uh, Proverbs chapter 24 this morning, and we are picking up wise saying number 22, which begins in verse 5 and 6. And I'd like for you to set a tab at a psalm, because we're going to look at that as an illustration of one of our Proverbs this morning, and that would be Psalm 18. So uh, if you would set a tab at Psalm 18, and then we're doing our exposition from Proverbs 24. This is wise saying number 22, beginning in verse 5. A wise man prevails by might, and a man of knowledge increases strength. Along with strength, guidance. You must wage war. And victory is won by many counselors. Saying 23 is comprised of just one standalone verse. Verse 7. Wisdom is too high for a fool. In the gate, he must not open his mouth. Saying 24, verses 8 and 9 together. As for the one who plans to do evil, he will be named a schemer. The schemes that come from folly are sin and an abomination to humanity is a mocker. Saying 25. And this is really comprised of verses 10 through 12, but I'm not going to go to 12 this morning. I'm going to save that, Lord willing, for the next time. So here is 10 and 11. If you show yourself... The King James translates this as faint, New American Standard, lacking. We have a wonderful word picture here. If you show yourself fainting or lacking in the day of crisis, your strength is small and meager. And then 11, deliver those being taken to death hold back. And I've got another wonderful word picture for that word as well. Hold back those who are staggering, stumbling, and being led to the slaughter. Well, here is our exposition this morning beginning chapter 24, verses 5 and 6, and saying number 22. A wise man prevails by might. Now here, wisdom is going to provide for us a panoply for victory. In the book of Proverbs, guidance, counsel, strength all go together. That's Proverbs 8, 14. Counsel is mine. Sound wisdom I have understanding. I have strength. Our top line here opens with the wise man. Who is the wise man in the book of Proverbs? Well, he is the one who is the teachable man. He is the man who listens to instruction, who accepts commands ever increasing in wisdom. See, that word that he accepts, it takes hold and it reproduces itself in powerful growth in the life of the individual. Thus, the man prevails by might. This is actually just one word, strong. In 2 Chronicles chapter 13 and verse 18, this word occurs, strong. The men of Judah were strong and thus were victorious or prevailed. 
by their faith in the Lord. Sounds rather simplistic, doesn't it? But I ask you, who teaches that? Who teaches they were strong and prevailed due to their faith in the Lord? You don't get that in the major universities in the country. They don't teach that. They don't get it in the front page of the Wall Street Journal. I love Stuart Varney. Fox Business every morning, but he doesn't teach that. Who teaches that? It sounds like the writer to the epistle to the Hebrews may be taught it. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 32. And what more shall I say? I don't have time to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah about David and Samuel and all the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, gained what was promised, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, escaped the edge of the sword, who in weakness was turned to strength and became powerful in battle and victorious. Foreign armies set to flight. All, according to the writer to the epistle to the Hebrews, by faith. By faith alone. Well, I want that faith. Give me some of that. Well, the apostle Paul tells us how to get it. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes from the Word of God. As a man appropriates the word, his courage becomes considerably larger. See, he's transformed. Last year, I read Dabigny's History of the Reformation. Small print, 700 pages. And it was so interesting the way he set the book up. It was, this is Germany. It wasn't Germany at the time, it was actually Saxony. But, and here's France, and here's what we call Great Britain. And these independent works of the Spirit of God just grew right out of these countries independently. No one collaborated with anyone. It wasn't the French who sent missionaries to Saxony or vice versa. It was just the Spirit of God moving in the hearts and minds of people. And when the printing press was invented and they got the Word of God out to common people, you had a wildfire all across Europe. What was interesting in that study, in that read, is studied throughout these countries were the martyrs. The martyrs. The Inquisition of the Roman Catholic Church. If you didn't recant your Reformation faith, they offed you. They burned you. They tortured you. One woman, in particular, they staked her down at low tide. And then when the tide came in, the water kept coming up. And the soldiers that did the execution were pleading with her to tears to renounce her faith, and she refused to do so. Those are people that the world is not worthy of. They prevailed by faith. And so they leave us a legacy as well. That faith we now understand is not some ephemeral something. It's really 
tied to one object. One object biblically, and that's knowledge. And that's what you have here in the proverb. You see, vital Christians, people that have real testimonies, are people of knowledge. They know the Scriptures. And so here's the idea. You get in your car and you drive here. And what you can't see, and what I can't see, is that we get in that car and we drive to this place in a sea of darkness. It comes to us in a thousand messages. This is the truth. This is the truth. And then you pull into this driveway. You come into Believer's Chapel and here is the light. Here is the real truth. How do I know that? Why am I so dogmatic about it? Well, because I read the Scriptures, and here they are for me. Daniel chapter 9, verse 1. In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understanding the Scriptures, According to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God and I pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting, in sackcloth, and in ashes. Two elements there that people have focused on from that one text. One is knowing the sovereignty of God. The absolute clear sovereignty of God is a motivation for prayer. Not indolence. Not sitting on your hands, but it actually provokes one to participate. And so Daniel does by prayer. The second of course, is glaring. The knowledge of God. It led him to know. It led him to understand who he was, where he was, his times, and his future. May I remind you that Daniel read that all in an absolute dark and pagan culture. Just like our own today. Finally, look, our proverb says, increases strength, musters strength. The idea is that it's a resource of power. This word, this knowledge of God. The word strength here is vital energy that the wise use and often call upon. An inner energy that produces Essential success for the believer in whatever endure, in endeavor he's involved with. John chapter 4, verse 32. Jesus put it this way. They were, the disciples were thinking about bread. He said, I have food to eat you know nothing about. It's His inner resource. The Word of God. And accomplishing that in his life was paramount to him. That was his eat. That was his drink. That is our that is our example. His living water that's in you as a regenerated believer that wells up within you and never can be quenched. I've seen it. Men so weak on their deathbed, they can hardly lift their hand. And they motion for me to come down. And I talk to them, whisper in their ear. This, I tell them, you're, it's all ahead of you now. Everything, all the bright lights, they're all ahead. 
You're leaving death and darkness. And this one man barely could hear him. He said, I believe that with all my heart. He was dead the next day. The Apostle Paul prayed for the Colossian church. That you would be filled, he said, with all wisdom and understanding. And that you would be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. And the end result would be endurance and patience. What we all need. What does wisdom produce? It produces inner strength, daily power. And that translates into a dynamic life. Verse 6, along with strength, competent counsel must be added to ensure success. Surely by guidance, you must wage war. And victory comes with many counselors. Line 1, this word guidance was used of the ancient ship's steering ropes. They didn't have a big wheel in the ancient world. They had big ropes tied to the sides of the ship and you would pull them one way and the rudder would go that way and pull them the other way. And so they these ancient ships would glide across the water. And that's what this guidance word is. It guides. It carries us. Proverbs 1.5 Let the wise hear and increase in learning. And the one who understands obtain guidance. Isn't it interesting, in the book of Proverbs, man is never stationary. Never. He's always moving in the book of Proverbs. He is either advancing in wisdom, or he is hardening until he ends up to be the indolent mocker at the end. Earlier in Proverbs 11.4, through many counselors, there was success in warfare. And that's the idea here in line two. With a spirit of humility, we speak the Scriptures to one another. And that gives you perspective and it makes the moment. I had that moment just a day or so ago. Uh, two friends of mine, we meet on somewhat of a regular basis with a mutual friend of ours. His wife is losing her mind through disease. And she is surely going downhill mentally. And he brought this to our attention. Uh, a brand new phase that she's going through in which she looked at him with a poker face and said, you know, I'd like to marry you. Of course, they've been married for decades. And he said, there's several ways that you can understand that and take that. And so he went through the declension of what that could be interpreted to mean. All the time, you could see the pain on his face. This man had been exemplary to me. He is a model for a righteous man who keeps his marriage covenant for richer, for poorer, for poorer, for for sickness and, and in health. He has been there with her all the way through. He is a giant in my eyes. And so when he finished, and he couldn't quite know how to interpret him, we couldn't interpret it for him, I reached over, put my hand on his shoulder, and I said, listen, 
That's why we're here. We're here for you. And we're going to stay here with you all the way. All the way. And then one of the guys said at that table, I know exactly where you are. You're John 111. You are where the Lord Jesus was. John 111. He came into his own, and his own received him not. I took the breath out of my lungs. It took the oxygen out of the room. I thought that was brilliant. It was the application of the Word of God in a random conversation. It was apples of gold in a setting of silver that met the moment. And there it was. No. The knowledge of God, the Scriptures applied to your life, is the most important thing that you can have because it goes beyond what you are going through. It gives you vital energy and the ability to interpret what is happening. What a great moment that was. I couldn't get it out of my mind. And so saying 23, verse 7, wisdom is too high for a fool. In the gate, he must not open his mouth. A proverb on the incompetence of a fool at the gate. Where public policy would be said in an ancient city. Now that gives us an interesting insight, I think, into Lot at Sodom. He had obviously no influence on that place that he desired to live. And the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God teaches us something from that experience that we read in Genesis. Uh, it's amplified, if you want to listen to the Bible in stereo, in the New Testament from Peter. 2 Peter 2.7, 2.17. He rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the godless lives of Sodom. Now, this word distressed, that's your English standard, your NIV. Oppressed is the New American standard, the King James. It the word means to be worn down, to be exhausted. They took the block of ice in the heat of the room, condensed it down. That's the idea of the word. And that's what the people at Sodom did to this good man, Lot. Swarm slick. No tread left on the tire. Now, our top line here opens. Wisdom is too high. The term high is figure. It's associated with wings and it's associated with feathers. Wisdom is too high for anyone to soar in public affairs among men. you got to have a man that knows the Scriptures that can really give you guidance and wisdom and can carry you. What is Lot? Well, he teaches me that when you are in the place that you're isolated and you have no fellowship and no one is ministering to you, you're in the wrong place. You know you're in the right place when you have fellowship and when you have the Word of God touching you, speaking to you. Those are the travelers on the Emmaus Road. They had that fellowship. Did not our hearts burn when He was speaking to us about the Scriptures? And suddenly you realize, gosh, this is not Lot. 
This is me. I see myself right here in the text. Back in the 80s, I had a business idea. And I had two men that thought I had a good idea and they, they gave me money and we started a business together. 1985. And it all worked. Worked very well. I had a lot of success. And it was around 1988, 89, maybe 90, that inadvertently someone from Believer's Chapel, Dallas, Texas, sent me a cassette. And the cassette was of my dear friend, Dan K. Duncan. I put the cassette in, and it was about Lot. And I listened to it, and I listened to it again. I think that first week I listened to it five or six times. Now, if you would have looked at me and known me, you would have said, well, there's nothing wrong with him. He's the same guy. He's always been. Still teaching a home Bible study. But I was being blown by the winds. And in that message, I wore that cassette out. I wore it out. In that message, I saw myself. You couldn't see it, but I could. I was being blown by success. And I made some hard commitments to the Lord right then and there. And I don't regret those commitments to this day. You see, the Word of God spoke to me right where I was. And I am a product of that message to this very day. That's why Lot means so much to me. And so here in line two are the consequences. In the gate, he must not open. This phrase literally reads, let his mouth not open. It means the wise of the city, don't let this man talk and make public policy. Now look at the mess we're in in this country. Because that's all we've got. We've got fools making decisions for us every day in public policy. But what's interesting over and over in the Proverbs is that the mouth of the fool is always open. Always. He's always talking. Or he's shoving something in it. But it's always open. He's not interested in listening, in learning. He's not interested in correction, not in objective truth. He's only interested in airing his opinions. And that's Proverbs 18 too. Fools find no pleasure in understanding, but delight in speaking their thoughts. That's the fool. That's the way he is. But the wise man listens and learns and grows. Here's verses 8 and 9, which make up the 24th saying, As for the one who plans to do evil, his name will be Schemer. Here we have a contrast to the competent counsel of the wise. The wise and skill make no room for moral evil whatsoever. See, they shut the fool down at the gate. And the public here... Once they get wind of 
wrong and evil. They rise up. They don't want villainy anywhere. And it's called evil among us. Plans, here is one in the same as this word schemes, dishonesty, cold, calculated strategies designed to further one's own personal interests at the expense of other people. That's the fool's behavior. But look at the consequences. They're striking. They despise the arrogant and the evil. And so look what they do in the proverb. They change his name. You see that? He's renamed a schemer. He loses his name, which is his reputation. Now he's known for what he really is in the community. In this book of Proverbs, over and over and over again, we've emphasized Proverbs 22.1. How much better is a good name than silver and gold? And what do men of the world do? They could care less what you think of them. Just load the wagon of my bank account. That's all. I'll go create my own happiness. I could care less what you think of me. But that's not the Proverbs. That's not the Proverbs. The Proverbs say your name is who you were, who you are, and what you'll be known as in the future. You protect your name above all else. Protect your name. Your name is valuable because you are not a pariah to the community. You are counted among the wise. Here's nine, the schemes that come from folly or sin and an abomination to humanity is a mocker. The final portion of saying 24 spells out the derivatives of one's schemes. Look, it's folly. That's the practice of living like there's no accountability. Sin, missing the mark, the standard of righteousness before God. And what we have are the crass acts against society in general. Line 2 describes this person as an abomination, meaning repulsive. See, I don't have to write a paper about a rotten egg. It needs no description. You know it instantly when you're close to it. It's repulsive. It's an abomination. That is this person. And here it is. Here it is in public policy. Just uh, half a year after the former governor of Virginia was making his public pronouncement, I was working on this proverb. And here was his pronouncement. You take a live child, deliver it, and we'll take it, and we'll put it into a room, and then we'll send counselors in, and we'll ask that mother, do you want to keep the child or not? And if we don't want to keep that child, we'll keep it comfortable until she makes that decision, and then we'll leave it. That's an abomination. That's murder. He's a mocker. He's a fool. And God will judge him for what he did and what he said. Look at this word to humanity. It's literally the word Adam from the garden. It occurs 44 times in the book of Proverbs. And here it states, Adam or humanity, it's the broadest form of collection of people. Like we say, the city. Finally, this is the life that describes the hardened fools. 
the mocker. Here's what he does. He's an actor that destroys himself. He's hard. Sin has taken its full effect upon him. Stay clear of this man. He is incapable of loyalty to anyone or anything because all of life is about me. That's the mocker. Verses 10 through 12. We'll just go to 11. It makes up saying 25. If you show yourself, this is a wonderful word, King James, faint. In the time or day of crisis, your strength is meager. Notice we begin with an if on the proverb. A hypothetical condition of weakness psychologically. No courage. No strength. The tests of life come, and here's what we see. The top line says it shows that we are lax. We are weak. The term literally slack. Now, here's the word picture for you. It occurs in Judges chapter 19 and verse 9. And it's used for the loss of daylight. The sun goes down and the light gets weaker and weaker and weaker. That's this word. Now, look at this phrase in the time of crisis. This is the phrase used in Proverbs 25, 19, in the day of crisis or trouble. The lexicon translates this as a defined period. For example, I would say, now Tuesday, we're getting that cold front, don't we wish? Uh, but we don't look for it Monday. We don't look for it Wednesday or Thursday. We look for it Tuesday. That's the idea. It's very specific. This is the day of calamity or crisis when a man is hemmed in and trapped by adverse circumstances called the providence of God. And therefore, he is trapped as well. Job chapter 1 and verse 13. Your Bible reads, one day. And that's how it begins for Job. One day. And his sorrows. Look at this final phrase, your strength meager. Literally, the word is narrow, and that's the word that we had from the narrow well in our last study, Proverbs 23, 27, describing the adulterous woman. She is a narrow well. She brings frustration and anger because you're trying to get the water up out of the well because you're in a land where there's no water and you have no strength to lift the rope that has the bag of water because of the narrow well. And that was this woman. She brings frustration. She brings anger into your life. She's the narrow well. Now the Bible has a complete and total solution for all of this. And here it is. The believer knows. He declares what the Bible says about him, that he has no strength. That in and of himself, he has nothing. See, that's the Reformation faith that we all inherited. Luther taught it to us. We sing it. Did we not in our own strength confide? Our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side. The man of God's own choosing. Who asked that may be? Christ Jesus. It is He. Lord Sabaoth His name. And He shall obtain the victory. That's how we learn to live in this world. Here's the testimony of David. Psalm 18. That's why I wanted you to look at this 
with me for just a moment. Beginning in verse 16. He sent from on high. He took me out of many waters. He rescued me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me. They were too strong for me, said David. They confronted me in the day of calamity. But the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. Before we get to the particulars, let me give you three points about this section. First, look where the mind of David is. It's high. It's from above. That's where the manna comes. Manna doesn't come from your transactions with men. That's just the result of what high has determined. See, all our resources come from there. And that's where David looked. He sent from on high. Here's the second thing. He called them his strong enemy. The inspired language actually is my enemy, making it personal, making it singular. Why is that important? Well, it's important because David was the king of Israel, which made him the vice regent of God on the earth. He was the will of God. His decision. So if you were an enemy of David's, you were an enemy of Israel, you're an enemy of God. That's his position. I can back that up by Psalm 2 and verse 6. I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. The Lord ensconced him in power. That's why he's the Lord's anointed and you don't touch him. God, he is God's will. So make a note here. We have, we have a king from Judah who's sitting on a throne in Jerusalem. And all his enemies will be wiped out. Does that sound familiar? That's what you have. Here's the third comment I want to make. Notice that it is the Lord in reference to third person singular. He, verse 16, two or three times. Verse 17, he. Verse 19, three times. Making David totally passive here. Why is that important? Because the Lord is doing all the work. He's the one that's doing all the rescue. The Lord is acting upon David. And that magnifies his power and his own strength. Now to the text itself. Verse 16, we, what we're looking at is David's actual rescue here. Back in verse 6, he called upon God. And now here is God breaking in and answering his prayer. The word rescue is literally to draw out. And you know where it's used? It's used in Exodus chapter 2 in verse 10. For Moses being drawn out of the water by Pharaoh's daughter. That's the rescue. You know where else it's used? Exodus 14. When Israel crossed over the Red Sea and they were drawn out of the Red Sea while Pharaoh and his charioteers were drowning in the exact same place. Can you hear echoes from the Apostle Paul, Romans chapter 8, He who is for us can never be against us. That's your faith. That's your God. He's acting upon you. His moment, His day of crisis, His enemies who hated Him, who were too strong for Him, personal foes, national foes, filled with passion, zeal for His destruction, and He calls them too strong. Much more than a man can handle. See, that's your life. Much more than you can handle. And notice it's the day, the hour of calamity. So here the Lord delivers David. And where does He deliver him? 
Look what your text says. He describes it as a broad place. Now let me show you something really neat from the Scriptures. Genesis 26. Isaac comes to a place called Gerar. You have a king, and he has an army, and you have an established political force in Gerar. And Isaac is this powerful, wealthy man. And he unplugs the wells of his father, but the men, the Bedouins of Gerar, they fill them back in. So what does he do? He moves away. He doesn't sue them. He doesn't declare war. He just moves away and he digs another well. And the Bedouins of Gerar, they confiscate him. In Texas, we call that stealing. They steal him. And so what does he do? Make war? No, he moves out. And he digs another water well. And what happens? They steal that. So he moves farther, farther away, and he calls it a broad place. A broad place. Now we have come to a broad place. And that ended the hostilities at Gerar. Genesis 26, 22, he declares that the Lord made room for us. That's the broad place of the will of God. A place of peace. Now, here's what's really neat. That word makes room, that's Proverbs 18, 16. The gift makes room for the man. You see, that's the will of God. The place of peace, the place of security. Let me end by showing you verse 19. Because here's your purpose, and this is not to be missed. Because if it's true for David, it's true for you. Because he delighted in me. That's Psalm 41, 11, by the way. I know that you are pleased with me because my enemy does not triumph over me. That's your election before the foundation of the world. That's his plan and purpose. And David says that he delights in him. My friends, the reason that you are a Christian is because he delighted in you. Now, I don't understand that. I understand it with me, but never with you. <laughs> but that's what the Word of God declares. And so, what is the summarization of all this? By, clo by closing the proverb, you feel weak, you feel lax, you feel beaten down. Well, your strength comes from above. Never here in your own heart. So what do you do? You apply knowledge. Stay in the Word. Stay in prayer. And you'll prevail. Why? Because He delights in you. He's got a plan and purpose for you. And it's a good one. And He'll take you through. Not around. Through. To His planned purpose for you. You know what that is? That's an incredible life. That's what Paul calls an exceedingly abundantly beyond anything we could ever ask or expect life. That's what that is from Ephesians. That's your life. Now go live it by faith. Let's pray. Thank You, Lord, for Your great faithfulness to us each and every day in Christ Jesus. He's all the answers at all times and in all ways and in all places. He frames our days and He gives purpose and meaning to us all. And that, Lord, we worship You and praise You for. In Jesus' name, Amen.